So today we're looking at um, two parts. We're looking at flexibility and we are looking at cardio. So, you know, if we were to look at like a blank OPT template, right, we would kind of be film, filling out like the warm up and the cool down. Now, NASM does not do a very good job of having like cardio templates. Like they don't do a really great job of being able to like write out like a cardio routine. Um, they usually just keep it really simple. And they're like, do this for X number of minutes. And it does not fit into their OPT template very well. I've come up with some workarounds that I think work okay. Um, but honestly, like the way they assign, like, you know, there's a really organized way to write out your workouts. They just don't give you one that's super organized for cardiovascular training. Um, and that's okay. Like, it doesn't mean that we can't, like, figure out how to write it out. So we'll be looking at some example cardiovascular routines today, um, as well as uh, the flexibility stuff, which is where we're going to start. So um, today we're going to tackle, like, you know, yesterday we talked about assessments. Today we're going to tackle how to work on the overactive muscles, right? That's what you address with flexibility training. Um, and then we'll look a little bit at, like, how to, you know, assign a... a a an effective cardiorespiratory routine, right? And that's what we're going to understand from looking at our three minute step test from the assessments. Um, and then after that, in the next few days, we'll move into the other stuff. So we are into the program design part of program design, which is always nice. Um, so today, introduction wise, uh, we want to understand like the physiologic changes to muscles that occur when we are doing flexibility training and understand how it can have really positive effects on our posture and our pat movement patterns and things like that. Um, we want to understand like how to safely progress our, our flexibility training. Uh, I will say one thing in the senior class. Um, they tend to only move through static and dynamic stretches, uh, but we will be looking at all three types of stretches, um, static, active, isolated, and dynamic. Uh, and then we will want to know how to actually apply those acute variables for whatever uh, phase of training our client happens to be in. So I love the flexibility day. Uh, you know, it's funny actually, guys. Um, let me see if I can find it. There's a new paper that came out somewhat recently that looked at uh, flexibility training protocols. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna, yeah, there's some scholarly articles. Um, but they did a, um, oh, actually this might be it right here. A survey of training protocols. Football clubs, no, <laughs> like that was so close. Like the first half of that was exactly what I, I thought I was looking for. Um, I'll have to find it and, and send it out as like a, as a separate email. But they've been looking at a, a couple different like flexibility training protocols. And what they found out of all of them um, is that the most effective way to increase flexibility, they kind of took a different approach to it. Instead of looking at it like how you stretch in the mid session, they kind of looked at it as like total stretching volume spread across like a week's time period. Um, and they found that like stretching a muscle or for a minimum of 30 seconds, so static stretches, um, around 10 times over the course of a week has been shown to sort of be the most effective. So if you're hitting about 10 sets per week of 30 second static stretches, um, that has been shown to like have really, really, really positive effects on flexibility training. And I read that article and I was like, that's really cool. Cause like that could, that could lead to you putting together a routine. That's not necessarily like something you do in the gym. Um, but it could just be something that you do like in the morning, if you wake up and you do, was it 10 sets or maybe it was 20 sets? Uh, five days, one, two. Oh, I'm sorry. It was it was time based as well. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to remember how this goes, but it was um, it was either 10 sets of 60 seconds. That's what it was, or 20 sets of 30 seconds over the course of a week's period of time. Um, so what you could do if you were doing like 20 sets of like 30 seconds, you could do two sets in the morning, um, just like 30 seconds on one muscle, 30 seconds on the night, you know, and just work your way through the body, and just do 30 seconds. Uh, twice, do two rounds, do like a circuit style, right? So if I did my calves, then my hamstrings, then my quads, then my hip flexors, then my TFL, uh, then my uh, then my core, then my spine, you know, I just work my way through and then I start back over and I did 30 seconds on each of those. You know, that might be like a 10 minute uh, time commitment, 10 minute circuit. And if I did that Monday through Friday, um, that would totally hit my total volume over the course of the week. 
Yeah, it's kind of cool. It, it, I, th I, I think it's more applicable outside of gym sessions. You know, I don't think it necessarily applies to like this type of training. Um, but that's been some new research that's been coming out, which I think is kind of, kind of fun. Um, I'm going to find that. I'll find that video and, and find the article and send it to you guys. Um, so anyway, uh, we do know that like when we're talking about flexibility, we, we, we are going to, you know, train to improve the range of motion of our muscles and improve their extensibility. Right. And that's sort of what we talk about when we look at our textbook definition of flexibility here. So, you know, flexibility is going to be defined as the ability to move a joint through its complete range of motion, right? So like, as we get older, some of those physiologic effects we've been talking about throughout this course, we know that like we experience a decrease in our flexibility. We experience joint stiff stiffness, our, our connective tissue tends to get a little bit less compliant. It gets, you know, a little stiffer and, and doesn't quite give as well as it used to. And so because of that, uh, we are not going to be able to move our joints the way that we are sort of designed to move them, right? You know, like I know that I've got like my tight muscles, you've got your tight muscles, you know, we've all got like sort of our postural distortions. And so like when that happens, when you decrease uh, your extensibility and you can't move that joint through its range of motion, you end up moving another way instead. Like, like I started, uh, I, was, I was, I was complaining um, uh, at ultimate actually we did a, we did a wednesday ultimate this week uh and i was like kind of complaining because i i'm not normally doing it in the middle of the week so i just hit like a really hard monday workout and so then it was like monday and then like i worked out in the morning on wednesday but i was so sore wednesday morning <laughs> and i was like oh lord you know <laughs> like uh and then i went and played ultimate later and i remember just like getting there for at the field like trying to like get ready to warm up and i was like Oh my chest! Oh my God! You know, like, I was like trying to raise my. I was like, Oh no! <laughs> and I was definitely like, my body was like trying to be like, No, 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 no! Don't stretch that out. Do this instead. You know, like instead of opening my chest, my body was like, Why don't you just keep your chest closed and raise your arms this way? <laughs> you know, like, and like that's what soreness does to us. But that's also what happens to us kind of slowly over time. I'm sure, I mean, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. We have those super sore days and you're just like, oh my goodness, you know, and you're trying to like kind of stretch out. Um, a lot of times for me, it'll be like my glutes, my glutes will get super sore. And so like sitting into a chair will be really rough. Um, and that's cause like, I love like, like, I love like a lot of leg work. Um, and so uh, anyway, you lose that ability to kind of move that joint through its motion. Luckily, soreness is like a temporary, you know, situation. But um, as we get older, those joints tend to get a little stiff. And so what we don't really realize while we're doing it is, you know, we go to raise our arm up overhead. And because like our shoulder might be really tight or something, we end up like maybe tilting to get the arm up instead, right? Um, we end up finding a different way to get the same job done. So there is going to be a loss of connective tissue uh, compliance there. When that happens, it st starts to alter. They're saying decreased proprioception here, uh, but I like to think of it as like altered proprioception. That's what you really end up with, right? Is you end up altering your proprioception. Because remember, proprioception, right? We know that that's our, our body's understanding of where it is in space. We've, we've given that definition 100 million times, right? We know that proprioception is how our body is you know understanding what position it's in how it's moving through the world and things like that um but you got to remember like the proprioceptors the the sensory receptors that are sending that information to the brain so that it can be interpreted right um those proprioceptors are are your golgi tendon organs they're your muscle spindles you know they are at like a length of a muscle and your your brain is programmed to remember you know, how you moved when you were in an ideal position, right? It's how you were designed to move. But if you've got a tight muscle and now that muscle refuses to let go, it's sending a signal to the brain saying, no, we're already at full length. We couldn't possibly stretch any further. So then your brain goes, oh, well, then we must be in this position. So then it tries to move that way, but because it's not in that position, because it's getting false data, right? Um, you're going to have altered or decreased proprioception. Uh, the way I always think of this, I, I, and so I always, I mean, like a new thing that I was thinking of the other day. Um, speaking of analogies, Irene, right? What's that, uh, 
what's that video where like um oh what is it called Pitch, uh Pictionary Telephone. You ever play Pictionary Telephone? It is a game where, you know, telephone is a game where like you say something to someone, you have to whisper it and then they whisper it and then they whisper it. And eventually like the, it gets further and further and further and further off, <laughs> right? Like um, you'll say something like, uh, what's this, Batman doing laundry, right? And then the way Pictionary Telephone works is someone will say Batman doing laundry and then someone will try to draw that as best they can. And then somebody has to interpret what was drawn and say Batman changing his pants. And then somebody else will draw what they were told to draw. And then we'll say Batman decided to become more fabulous. And eventually it just gets further and further and further and further and further off. <laughs> um, and that's Pictionary Telephone. Uh, it's a super fun like party game. Um, you know, you can see Let's see here, uh, those are too low quality, but the cat likes to eat French fries, right? And so we drew that and it's like smiley cat serving treats, juice and cookies, right? And then that person, and then this person wrote, Cheshire cat gets milk and cookies, right? So it's like somewhat close, right? Um, so that's, that's totally, that's like a fun game, but I always think of that, like I've been thinking about that lately and like that's what altered proprioception is, right? Like that's totally what's going on in your body when you got a muscle that's saying, yeah, I'm at full length now, I can't stretch any further. And your brain goes, oh, okay, well, since we can't stretch any further, we'll move in this other way to get the job done, right? And you do it without kind of realizing. It's not really like a conscious decision, you know? Um, sometimes you're sore, like let's say you had a really hard workout, you gotta pick something up, right? And so you hinge at the waist to grab something, but then your hamstrings are really tight. So instead you do this and then you twist and you get it, right? Um, that's definitely not our default setting. That's not how we're really designed to move, but it is how we practically move, right? Um, so that whole concept, right? We do know that our seniors experience that. Um, flexibility is very important for developing that proprioception because it resets your body's ability to understand like when the muscles are at their proper resting length, right? Your body understands where it is in space due to length tension relationships, right? Remember length tension relationships, we talked about that yesterday, uh, it is the ideal resting length of a muscle and how much force it can produce at that length. Senior clients will experience altered length tension relationships which result in altered gait mechanics, which is their walking or altered postural distortions. And that's why you start to see, you know, as we get older, you start to see that old bitty shuffle, you know, where somebody is like walking along and they're doing this thing, right? <laughs> and it's like, you don't have to walk like that. <laughs> You're walking like that because you feel like your muscles are too tight to be able to take a full step, or you feel like you're walking like that uh, because that's the only way to ensure that you're not going to like step on something. But if you have proper proprioception, proper balance and proper flexibility, you're not gonna have to deal with those problems, right? So anyway, there's my big old morning rant on why flexibility training is so important. I think I'm spending so much time on it because I do not do enough flexibility training in my own life. And so, you know, I'm giving you guys a sales pitch so that I hear it <laughs> and be like, hey man, like you just talked about why it's so important. Stop skipping your cool downs. Uh, so <laughs> let's go ahead and um, look at how those altered length tension relationships are going to actually practically affect things. So we already know that like, if you have an alteration in uh, the length of a muscle and you have an altered length tension relationship, that's going to lead to altered movement patterns. And we gave this a, we gave this a, a, a title here. Um, altered flexibility is going to lead to what we call relative flexibility. So relative flexibility is not really, it's not really a type of flexibility, right? It's, it's, it's just a term that describes your body seeking the path of least resistance during functional movement patterns. So the body finds the easiest way to get the job done, even if it's not really designed to move that way, right? So the body learns to move in a way that is altered from the way that it was designed to move. A really good example of that are all of the postural distortions on the overhead squat assessment, right? Your client's feet externally rotate during a squat. That's an example of relative flexibility. So what happened, right, is your client 
starts to like, let's say they're here, right? Um, and I don't know if I can run a little bit. <laughs> oh, come on now. Come on now. Stay. There we go. All right. So your client has really tight ankles, right? So because they have limited dorsiflexion, right, they have a limited ability to pull their toes back this way, right, uh, they are going to find a different way to move to get the job done. So as they're squatting, they might squat like this, and then all of a sudden they start to get tight, and they start to feel like they're falling backwards, right, because this can't stretch any further this way, and the tibia can't come any more forward on the ankle. So instead what it does is it goes, well, I don't have to stretch if I just turn the feet this way. And then you can drop super low, you know? Um, that's what you're gonna see in relative flexibility, right? It's the body finding a way to sort of get the job done, even if that's not how you're really designed to move, right? Every single one of our postural distortions is an example of relative flexibility. Feet turn out, feet flatten, knees cave in, uh, knees cave out. Uh, what are the other ones we got? Uh, excessive forward lean, low back arch, low back round, arms fall forward, forward head posture, shoulders elevate. Every single one of those. Um, is going to be from tight muscles refusing to stretch to full length, so then the body finds a different way to move, right? And that's all what we mean when we say relative flexibility. So if that's the case, all we got to do is the exact opposite of whatever our body is naturally a little too good at, right? So when we look at, um, I'm going to look at a length tension relationship here. Right, if we look at a length tension relationship and we know that it's basically a muscle that's staying in a shortened position, I do love this chart actually. Um, so here's, here, you know, here's that length tension relationship. This is ideal, right? This is a, a super ideal amount of overlap between actin and myosin fiber. So this is an optimal resting length. This is a perfectly strong and perfectly flexible muscle. Um, whereas over here, this is a shortened muscle that's very overactive, that's a tight muscle. And over here, that's an underactive lengthened muscle. Because here's the thing, here's why this is so bad for us, right? Because until now, we've been talking about tight muscles, but we got to remember all of the muscles in your body, uh, altered joint mechanics, um, all of the muscles in your body are organized to have an, ag an antagonist, right? An agonist and an antagonist. Um, that's not what I want. Uh, there we go. So um, all of the muscles in your body are arranged around your joint like this, right? At a at a, an ideal balance, right? This muscle's pulling for an equal amount to this muscle, right? Uh, but here, this is a shortened muscle, right? So this overactive muscle is what we're seeing on the chart on this side. The actin myosin fibers are already overlapping. And then this is an underactive muscle, which is on this side where the actin and myosin fibers are not overlapping enough. So there's almost, it's almost like they can't get a really good grip. So we got a weak muscle on one side of a joint and a tight muscle on the other side of the joint. So don't get me wrong, we're spending all of our time today talking about the overactive muscles, right, and how to stretch these out. Um, but the rest of, you know, you got to remember the rest of your workout is spent turning on the underactive stuff. So if I had a client whose feet turn out, I know that they have an overactive gastrocnemius or an overactive soleus, right? Because they are experiencing limited dorsiflexion, which means they are too good. They are doing way too much excessive plantar flexion. So if they're doing excessive plantar flexion, and that's why their foot had to turn out because they are just not good at dorsiflexion, I need to stretch out those plantar flexion muscles. I need to stretch out those tight muscles that are refusing to relax. And then, if I leave that alone, that may not be enough to really fix this problem, right? Like if I only spend my time untying one side of the joint, I'm not addressing the other side of the joint, right? So what do I also need to do? Well, I also need to do a strengthening exercise for my dorsiflexors, right? On the opposite side of the joint. 
Um, is that making sense, guys? I mean, you guys have heard this before. I know it makes. I know you, you're already experts on this, but yeah, that- yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but nonetheless, you said even though muscles are overactive, they're still weak, right? Yeah, that's what's. You know, this is. I always put an asterisk on this. Um, you're you're right, Robert. Like I always put an asterisk on this because I catch myself saying this sometimes. Like I'll be a little lazy about things when I sometimes describe it. You get an overactive muscle that's pulling too much, or I'll sometimes say you got an overactive muscle that's too strong. That's a decent enough way to describe it to your clients if you're describing like what it is you're working on, but it's not very accurate scientifically, right? Like that's not actually what's happening. It's not that it's too strong. It's just that it is not relaxing. It's firing when it shouldn't. Your nervous system is overactive because it's getting a signal from the brain saying, no, 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 I can't stretch out any further. And so then your brain goes, oh, really? Oh, well then you should contract. So then it pulls and it just fires at the wrong time. So it's, yes, it is overactive and it's tight, but it's still weaker than it should be, you know? Um, Because it's got to do like the Bruce Lee one inch punch, you know? (laughs) Like, um, you know, like if you want to be able to throw, like imagine I had to like throw a ball, right? Um, Like, let's say it's like a, a baseball and I had to hold my arm here before throwing that baseball. I'm already like halfway through a throw. So I don't have very much force, you know, like it's not gonna go very far, right? But if I'm able to like snap back and then throw it, I'm gonna have way more force. So if I'm in an already shortened position, I don't have very much ability to generate force. But likewise, you know, if I freaking twist my arm all the way back around and it's in an overly lengthened position, well, I'm also going to lose force. So underactive and overactive are both weaker than they should be. But the overactive one is the one that's firing all the time. And the underactive one is the one that like isn't firing at all. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's not that it's weaker. It's just it has more force to it. Right? Uh, What's, I I, might have just lost it. What do you, what's Uh, the okay so it's not it's not that the the overactive muscle is weaker it's just it has more force to it but not strength no 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 it is it is weaker than it should be it is stronger than the muscle on the opposite side of it it's it's stronger than its antagonist but it is weaker than its potential that's a good way to put it oh okay okay like here's a, here's a really good example right so like um here actually you know what we'll pop quiz it uh, which is always brutal and makes people sweat. Uh, pop quiz. <laughs> what should you not do when it comes to flexibility training before a strength level workout? Static stretches. Nailed it. So you shouldn't do static stretches. Why? Well, we've talked about this and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit. Uh, (laughs) You shouldn't do static stretches before a strength level workout because strength level workouts are all about force production, right? They're all about maximum strength. And one of the side effects of static stretches is that you're exhausting those muscle spindles. And so because you are like spending so much time under the stretch, the muscles, freaks out at first, which is that stretching sensation that you feel. So the muscle's like, blah, 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 blah. And then eventually it's like, and it just kind of falls asleep, right? So you turn the signal off. Well, now your muscle's a little groggy. So it has been shown to reduce your ability to produce force in those muscles. So when you go to like lift really heavy, you're gonna have less force production. So, you know, it's counterproductive to my goal. If I do static stretches before I want to lift heavy, I can't lift as heavy. So now I've made my workout a little bit worse, right? So that's why we don't do static stretches before strength workouts, although we are going to stretch. We're just going to do different types of stretches. Um, So looking at that, right, um, I almost have lost where I was going with this. (laughs) So looking at... uh, um, what a static stretch does, right? It is making the muscle groggy. So we always say we shouldn't do static stretches before we do strength. I just found it. So (laughs) here's the exception to that rule. Like what I just told you is generally true. Okay. What I just said is 
in most situations a true sentence. However, there are exceptions to the rule. There are times when you will have a client who is doing a strength level workout and you still need to do static stretches. And that time or those times are when your client has altered posture due to overactive muscles. So let's use the chest as an example because it's always easy for me to show on camera. Let's say I got a client who's got this type of posture, right? They got the rounded shoulders. See, I'm, I'm protracting, though that's really extreme, but let's say I've got really extreme shoulder protraction, right? Um, and I walk into the gym and I'm like, I'm excited. It's Monday, it's chest day, let's do this. I'm gonna set a new record on my bench, right? Here's the thing. These muscles right here are already really overactive. So they're just constantly contracting for a little bit of force, right? So I'm hanging out in this position here. My trainer is like, all right, we're going to work on that maximum strength today. And it's like, great, let's do it. I'm excited, right? And then they're like, let's do some stretches for your chest to get you warmed up. And then I'm like, well, wait a minute. I read an article or I heard a YouTuber tell me that uh, I shouldn't do static stretches before I start to do my strength workout. And here's the thing. It's true if you don't have super overactive muscles, but if my muscles are like this, right? Oops. Um, if they're in that altered length tension relationship, right? And they're in this version right here where they're all, the actin and myosin fibers are already crossing each other. This muscle fiber is weaker than it should be. It may be stronger than this one over here, right? It may be pulling for more than this muscle on this side of the joint, but it's still weaker than it should be. So if all of a sudden I do like a static stretch and now I get my muscle fibers relaxed to an optimal length tension relationship, there are circumstances where static stretches will actually lead to greater strength gains, but only if this was the situation that you were in beforehand. Does that make sense, Robert? Yes, so only, only when it's super, super, super overactive, yep. then you wanna go ahead and do static. Totally. But then, okay. but then once you get everything uh, cleared out and everything like that, then you can go ahead and start doing your active. Yeah, and, yeah. Once, well, I, once, once your postural distortions are not like such a problem, you can go ahead and start going back to active. Yeah, once you once you go through the the cycle again, right? Totally. Yeah. Also, by the way, uh, I know I haven't said this. I mean, I, I do say this pretty often, but it's not in your textbook. There is also a ton of evidence to suggest. I, I just NASM doesn't put it in the book. Um, I don't know if it's because like they don't believe in the research or they don't think it's like well qualified, but you know, maybe I think they might just be a little str more stringent than I am. There's a lot of research to suggest that even if you do do some static stretches for your muscles, if you follow those static stretches up afterwards with like a dynamic stretch for the same muscle, which creates that kind of like, you know, bouncing sensation, which actually turns the muscles on, um, it totally undoes like any of the negative effects that you have while still maintaining the range of motion. Um, so we, we've, I've, I've mentioned that a few times, but like there is a lot of evidence to suggest that if you're really worried that you turned your chest off, go do some arm circles and it'll turn right back on um, for the most part. Uh, I do want to use one more example uh, just for the sake of it because this is the most common, sort of the most common underactive muscle we've got. Uh, let's look at your glutes, right? So if we look at like our, our uh, glutes versus hip flexors, Right, and we look at how they're arranged on the body, uh, we know that these are total opposites of each other, right? We know that like you've got your hip flexor complex on the front, it's in charge of hip flexion, and you've got your glute complex on the back, which is in charge of hip extension, right? So hip flexion, hip extension, hip flexion, hip extension, right? Um, and so they do exact opposite things as each other. Um, so one is going to be, uh, let's see here, hip, flexion. One is going to pull your knee this way, right? Uh, and it's going to pull it up like that. And, or I'm sorry, your knee. <laughs> One's going to pull your hip up this way. Good God. And uh, the other one is doing the exact opposite. That's your hip extension. That's kicking your butt back. So during like a, you know, squat or something, right? Standing up out of a chair is a, is hip extension. Um, I'm in a hip flexion position right now. 
I'm in hip extended, right? So if I spend all day sitting in a chair, I'm gonna get really tight, really overactive hip flexors, right? I'm gonna get really good at that hip flexion movement. Meanwhile, my glutes on that opposite side of the joint, they're going to get weakened, right? But here's the thing, all of them are weakened, right? I just have hip flexors that are weaker than they should be, even though they are pulling more than they should. Doesn't mean they are, they're still weaker than their potential. They're just pulling for more force or pulling passively or neurologically activated all day long. So what I need to do is I need to do a hip flexor stretch and I need to do a glute activator, like a glute strengthener. And this is all like this concept of what we're talking about and how to fix these, these overactive, underactive muscles. It becomes a lot clearer when you guys get to capstone. I mean, it's, it's, it should be clear now, but it's going to get even clearer uh, when you get to capstone because um, the NASM CES, the corrective exercise specialist, um, uh, when you get to your CES model, um, oh, that's right, they call it the CEX model, uh, you're going to look at something like this. And this is actually sort of a four step process that you're going to go through whenever you see an altered joint mechanic. So you will inhibit an overactive muscle, then you will lengthen the overactive muscle, then you will activate the underactive muscle, and then you will integrate the underactive muscle. So going back to my pecs from earlier, right? If I've got an overactive pectoral muscle, right? Uh, which maybe it's like my pec minor that's causing shoulder protraction. Well, then I've got underactive middle traps and rhomboids, which are my shoulder retractors, right? So. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to inhibit my uh, pec minor, maybe through like a little bit of massage technique, like a lacrosse ball or a massage gun or something like that. I'm gonna dig in and try to get that pec minor to relax. Then I'm gonna lengthen it through static stretches afterwards. So I've inhibited it with the foam rolling or the self fascial release. Then I've lengthened it with the stretches. Then I'm gonna do an activation technique for my rhomboid slash middle trap. So maybe that's, like a reverse fly or a row. And then I'm gonna do an integrated technique, which an integrated technique means I'm going to do more exercises for those muscles that I just taught how to work, but while my body is doing some more complicated stuff. So I might do like a reverse lunge to single arm cable row. And like, that's a very complicated movement. So I'm integrating this muscle that I'm not used to working with like my entire body. So I've got a lot to focus on while also getting that, that muscle to fire. So that's something you're gonna learn when you get to capstone. That's that's where like we totally change the whole um, sort of paradigm. I mean, you'll notice we do this anyways. Like this is totally what we spend our time doing when we write our workouts, right? Like today we're writing flexibility programs. We're gonna start with foam rolling, then we're gonna move to stretches, and then afterwards, you know, after today's class, we'll move into the strengthening stuff. So it's really not that different from a regular training session, but it is broken down with like a little chart there that makes a little more sense. Um, did that kind of clear up the idea of like, you know, overactive and underactive muscles are both weak, um, or at least weaker than they should be. But overactive muscles are basically muscles that are firing too often and underactive muscles that are not firing enough. Clear? Love it. All right. So, Let's do it. Let's do let's, What do we got? How do we actually stretch? <laughs> well, um, your flexibility training is going to include, uh, be included in the warm up portion of your general workout, right? By the way, actually, you know what? While I'm at it, just because I already mentioned the CES, NASM CES um, uh, template is the word I'm looking for. Just because I've already mentioned it, here is NASM's. CES template. Um, looks a little bit different than your standard, but you'll notice like you're gonna, it has it broken down. It, you're gonna, in hip, let's say you have a client, um, we already did the chest. Let's say it's, it's the hip flexors, right? Tight hip flexors, weak glutes, right? They've got an anterior pelvic tilt. So if your client has an anterior pelvic tilt, you'll pick like a few SMR exercises for hip flexor muscles. So I would write SMR, uh, let's say, um, 
uh, quadriceps, and then I would go on to another one and say SMR, uh, let's say um, TFL, and then I would go SMR. Um, let's IT say, band? Yeah, we could do the IT band. It's controversial. I'm, I might be giving up on the IT band. There's just so much research at this point. I was uh, like a long, I've been a holdout for a long time saying it's fine as long as you're actually relaxing, but yeah, we'll give it the IT band. Why not? Um, so IT band, hip flexors, quadriceps, and lats, right? So then, you know, lengthen, I'm going to do a static IT band stretch. I'm going to do a static kneeling hip flexor stretch, a static standing TFL stretch, and a static ball lat stretch. There we go. I inhibited and lengthened all my overactive stuff. Now I need to turn on my hip extensor. So I'm going to activate through like a, a glute bridge. Um, I'll do a glute kickback. Um, I'll do some lateral tube walking uh, or maybe like clamshells. Uh, and then I'll do like a prone cobra, right? Actually, a prone cobra would be a bad idea because that's actually a rector spinae. Uh, I'll do a plank actually, because I got to get the core turned on as well. Um, we've really only been kind of looking at the glutes. <laughs> um, so uh, there we go, right? Um, so now I've activated my underactive stuff and then I'm gonna integrate them, right? I'm gonna do a total body integrated movement. I'll do like a ball squat curl to press or a walking lunge uh, with a medicine ball twist, you know? Um, don't have to pick all four, don't have to pick, you know, you can only pick two if you want, uh, but you'll notice there's actually a really, there's several, uh, NASM, CES, anterior pelvic tilt. Let's see how the program that I just built um, holds up to one that NASM built. So they have a lot of like blog stuff on their website. And I'm assuming, no, they didn't put one up here. Okay, I guess you can do that that way if you want to. Okay, oh, never mind, never mind, there it is. <laughs> Usually they put up the table the way I pulled it up. So you'll inhibit with the TFL, you'll foam roll the TFL and the rectus femoris, then you're gonna lengthen, one set, 30 second holds, kneeling hip flexor stretch, TFL static stretch, activate uh, resisted hip extension. Um, so I, this isn't resisted, but if she had a resistance band tied around her foot here, right, while she was doing the bird dog, that'd be a really good one. Um, or the quadruped opposite arm, opposite leg raise, that's actually what this exercise is. And then she's gonna integrate it with a ball squat curled overhead press. So pretty similar to the one we built. Um, so there's a lot of really good ones up there on NASM's blog that you can check out that, that'll kind of teach you how to do that. But again, let's go ahead and get back to the normal stuff today. Um, I'm giving you a preview. Mo's gonna be like, why does everybody already know what I'm supposed to teach them? Uh, <laughs> um, let's go ahead and get back uh, to our flexibility training here. <laughs> normal flexibility training, I should say. So um, it is included in the warm up um, portion, and it's going to consist of when you're writing a flexibility program. It's going to consist of two parts: the part where you are foam rolling, and that's going to be your self myofascial release. So self myofascial release, like myofascial release, is in general is just any time you're putting pressure on proprioceptors in order to get that muscle to relax, right? When you put pressure on a Golgi tendon organ, and that causes it to sort of override that overactive muscle spindle and force it to relax, right? So, you know, we are gonna look at SMRing uh, in, you know, even this, just like me working on my pec minor here, giving myself a little massage, that is totally, good God. Uh, <laughs> pressed too hard. That is totally, um, uh, an example of self myofascial release. There's also a bundle of nerves there, so be gentle. Um, and then we've got like foam rolling in its traditional sense, right? Getting on a foam roller and, you know, finding a tender spot, maybe relaxing for 30 seconds. Using a lacrosse ball is really great. Um, or a theracane, right? That little cane with like the handles that you can reach up and over. Uh, tiger tails or massage guns. All those are examples of self myofascial release. Um, then it's going to consist of your actual stretching techniques. And those stretching techniques are going to be organized uh, by the levels that you are training in, right? So for the purpose of integrated program design, NASM is going to organize your flexibility training into levels that correspond with that OPT model, right? Remember, NASM's OPT model is that staircase of three levels, right? Five phases, but three levels. So in the stabilization level, 
we've got specific types of stretches we're gonna do. In the strength level, we've got type, specific types of stretches. And in the power level, specific types of stretches. So that's what we're gonna be going over from here. So um, the first one you're looking at, if you've got a client who is in the stabilization level of the OPT model, right? They're in this bottom part of the staircase. So you've got them in the stabilization phase, Stabilization phase falls under the authority of the stabilization level, right? So that means that you are going to perform corrective flexibility, right? So in the stabilization level, level one, phase one, you are gonna perform corrective flexibility. This is the type of flexibility training that is designed to improve joint range of motion and it is used to correct postural distortions. Now, that is something that we say a lot I just want to make it clear though, guys, um, active stretches also have a really positive effect on postural distortions. It's just that static stretches are definitely the best ones because they are great at turning a muscle off so that you can create length. Active stretches do it as well. They just don't do it quite as well. Um, but there are benefits to active stretches because they don't re result in that neurological grogginess that we talked about. So, if I'm lifting at high repetitions, I don't care about that neurological grogginess because I'm not lifting at a super high intensity. Um, so I'm gonna do static stretches. But if I'm lifting at a super heavy weight, well, then I probably don't wanna do static stretches because it's gonna make my muscles not activate the way I want them to. They might fire improperly. Um, and so that's definitely not something we wanna see. So corrective flexibility is going to consist of two techniques here. It's going to consist of self myofascial release and static stretches, right? Um, so self myofascial release is going to focus on your neural and fascial systems. And what you're doing is you're alleviating myofascial trigger points. So if we look at like a myofascial trigger point, um, there we go. That's a great picture. It's going to be stuff like this, right? So you can see, there's all these little, you know, like these are some healthy muscle fibers right here, but then you got these little guys, which are all kind of bunched up, right? Basically your nervous system has uh, gotten a signal from those muscle fibers saying like, hey, we've experienced some trauma or something and we really don't want to relax anymore. Because if we relax, we think that we're going to tear. You know, your body's designed to, you know, those overactive muscles, they get that way because your body thinks that it's protecting itself, you know? Like if I wanna keep something from tearing, I'm gonna make sure that I don't lengthen it out all the way. So I'm gonna keep it bunched up, right? Um, you know, if I've got a rope that I don't wanna tear, I'm just gonna bring the rope closer together. <laughs> like, um, easy enough, you know, it takes the tension off. But the problem is that, that, you know, that is now not working the way it's supposed to. So a lot of times what you'll see is it's bunched up kind of like that. Um, I always like to think of, um, I was hoping somebody would have a picture of what I'm looking for here. Um, but here's another way to kind of think of uh, like overactive muscles. I'm gonna pull up good old paint here. It kind of looks like, like if this were a healthy fiber, um, we're gonna keep this so very simple. How do I make this bigger? There we go. Um, picture that as like a normal healthy fiber, right? Just you know, length to length, right? Well, if my fiber has like maybe some uh, like trauma, you know, maybe I like pull the muscle a little bit. And so I've got these fibers in the center that are maybe a little tender now. What might happen is my muscle sort of folds over itself like this and it creates kind of almost like a little bubble. And now my muscle is shorter than it should be because that section in the middle is sort of folded over itself. And now I'm definitely not going to stretch out these possibly damaged fibers, but I'm also not going to have the type of length I should have in my muscle fiber, right? And that's really what we're seeing when we say like a trigger point. That's what we're talking about. Or we're talking about how your nervous system has started making a muscle fire more often than it should because it just got used to doing that type of movement, you know? Maybe you didn't experience any trauma because you've just been sitting in a chair eight hours a day, 40 hours a week for the last 20 years. So there's no trauma in your hip flexors, but your nervous system is so used to being in a hip flexed position that has a hard time, you know, relaxing that position. So you'll see the same, same kind of situation there. So uh, question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, I know this is really not kind of our area, 
But uh, I, is that is that what massages mean when they talk about knots? Yeah, that's what. Yeah, knots. Got, yep. Trigger point. You got a lot of knots. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, there's trigger point therapy sometimes refers to it just ever so slightly different. Um, cause there is like nerve, you know, your nervous system's all interconnected, right? So sometimes you'll get like trigger point therapy where it talks about how it's like, I'm getting pain back here in my back and somebody will massage like over here on a totally different part of your body. But by relaxing this muscle, all of a sudden you let go of a, like all the way up and around. So sometimes you'll hear trigger point therapy referred to, you know, if you've got pain here, you massage over here, um, which is like weird, right? Um, so sometimes that refers to trigger point therapy, but yeah, for the most part, Robert, on a very basic level, when we say like knots or trigger points, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about just like little, you know, adhesions in your muscles, um, scar tissue, you know, like I've, I've totally like, I've had tight hamstrings due to like postural habits and things like that. But at the same time, like I also have really overactive hamstrings, you know? Um, and so like I get really tight on this, particularly on my left hamstring. So, you know, I always got to make sure that I, like when I'm massaging, I spend a little more time there um, because like it's got, I can feel knots in my hamstring, you know? Um, Actually, you should ask Mo. Mo's giving me a massage here and there. And he's like, Ooh. <laughs> it's real knotted up. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> that's how we're going to do self-myofascial release, right? Self-myofascial release is going to benefit from that concept that we talked about in kinesiology, autogenic inhibition, right? Where we are decreasing the neural drive to that muscle. We put pressure usually on a Golgi tendon organ, um, we put pressure on a Golgi tendon organ and that inhibits an overactive muscle spindle, right? So you can see uh, here, that's actually not what I'm looking for. Um, there we go. Oh, please have a higher, please be high res. Ugh, okay, good enough. So here's like the nerve itself, right? This is your, your spine right here. So you can see like there's a muscle spindle running throughout the entire length of the muscle. And then there's a, a Golgi tendon organ located, you know, in the tendon right as it inserts onto the bone. So when you put pressure here, that is going to create an inhibitory signal that will travel up and tell this to shut up, <laughs> right? You got a muscle that's overactive creating a knot, right? It's bunching those fibers together, holding them. And then you put pressure on that Golgi tendon organ, which causes both of them to kind of freak out, by the way. And that's why it kind of hurts when you're foam rolling. You're like, ah, right? But then after about 30 seconds, it slowly, you know, causes the whole thing to relax. And then it lets go of those overactive fibers and your knot becomes not so knotty. <laughs> so um, that is sort of why we do self-myofascial release. We put pressure on the Golgi tendon organs or we put pressure on the adhesion itself. We're either putting pressure on the Golgi tendon organ to create autogenic inhibition or we're putting pressure on the knot in order to kind of rub it out and get it to relax um, to full length. Now, the, uh, oh, and there's lots of other tools that you've got here. Well, I've already talked about this. Um, however, with your senior clients, by the way, um, be a little cautious with foam rolling. Um, using a foam roller might be a little bit too much pressure. It might cause some bruising. So instead you might find that like a tiger tail or a theracane, something where they can kind of, you know, um, regulate the pressure themselves. Uh, gives them a little bit of like mechanical advantage to hit those hard to reach areas while also not putting too much pressure. And then they can make sure that they're not bruising or anything like anything like that. So it doesn't mean that you can't do self myofascial release with your senior clients. It's just, you probably might, you might want to avoid foam rolling. Um, now our rules for foam rolling are going to be the same rules for our static stretches. So I'm going to come back um, I'm going to come back to this in just a second and look at these numbers. Um, but basically you want to experience, you're going to experience some discomfort, um, but you're going to try to hold any tender areas for a minimum of 30 seconds. That's going to inhibit that overactive muscle. Then we can follow that up with static stretches afterwards or active stretches or dynamic stretch. We can follow it up with any type of stretching afterwards in order to lengthen that now inhibited muscle out. Right. Um, 
you know, you knocked the muscle out. Now let's stretch it, you know? And that's where our static stretches come in. Static stretches are low force, long duration stretches. And they're also going to use autogenic inhibition, but they do it in a slightly different way, right? Autogenic inhibition, again, pressure on a Golgi tendon organ, inhibiting an overactive muscle spindle. With the foam rolling, we put pressure on that Golgi tendon organ literally by poking it, right? Well, with static stretches, we're putting pressure on it simply by lengthening out the muscle, by stretching the muscle from end to end. That still puts pressure on those Golgi tendon organs. That's why when you guys are doing your stretches, generally, and I, this isn't always the case, but generally, if it's not like you being sore from a workout, you'll feel the tension usually around your joints. You know, like when I stretch my hamstrings, for instance, I feel it right behind the back of my knee. That's where my Golgi tendon organs are because that's where my tendons are, right? Your tendons always insert right before they, they, you know, attach on one side or another of a joint. So both of them are going to, so SMR and static stretches both benefit from autogenic inhibition, although they are doing it in slightly different ways from each other. Um, so what you're going to do for static stretches, same rules here, you're going to do one to two sets and you're going to do it for a 30 second hold at least you can go up to 60 seconds. Heck, I just saw a pro I, was I telling you guys about this? Um, I just saw a protocol the other day that is like a 10 minute static stretch. <laughs> um, it's literally where you heat a muscle for 10 minutes and while it's heated, you hold it in like a lengthened position. Then at the end of that 10 minutes, you hold it for another five minutes under ice. And uh, that's like a 15 minute static stretch. And I was like, that is crazy. Um, but I, that's got to be a lot of information to your central nervous system, you know, like the heat and the cold and the lengthening and stuff like that's got to, you got to be real bendy after that. <laughs> um, so uh, that is, that is uh, sort of our static stretches in a nutshell there. And that's, that's how we write flexibility programs for our clients who might be in level one. Uh, do you guys have any questions about that? Feeling good, you two? No questions, but just um, uh, actually, I guess, yeah, I do have a question about what you just mentioned with the static stretch for 10 minutes. Um, so they're holding that stretch, like not moving with heat or cold. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Is that sort of like calisthenics? Isn't calisthenics where you hold a position for a long no. time? Calisthenics just refers to anything that's body weight exercise. Like body weight. Is that are those are calisthenics. Oh, okay, because I see those guys doing like, you know, sideways on their body, like holding the bar, like that's perfect. Oh, ridiculous. sure, yeah. I mean, like that's a that's that's totally a that is a calisthenic, but it's not. But calisthenics are not always isometrics like that. Oh, oh. You know? they blew me away, man! I was like, oh, I know. Hey. The flag? yeah, I yeah. love them. I it's I've never been able to do flag. Oh, I love it. All right, um, so. I've got a handout here that I'll, I'll go over later, but we're gonna talk about how to build that static stretch routine, right? So you can see we kind of, I'm just gonna give you a really quick example here, right? We would foam roll the calves and hip flexors, then we would static stretch the calves and hip flexors. We'd maybe do a little bit for the erector spinae as well. Uh, and then we put them on a recumbent bike for five minutes to warm up. And there you go, that's a stat, that's a level one routine. Um, we'll look at more of that in just a second. Now, you'll notice the PowerPoint is going to skip straight over to dynamic stretches. I got to take a quick pit stop and stop us at uh, active stretches first, though, so we can do the strength level. Um, so it's just that the, the senior textbook kind of glosses over um, active stretches because it's like, they're seniors. You're not worried about max strength. And it's like, I get that approach, but we got to learn it all. So. If you got a client in level two, right? So if we go back to that OPT model and they are in the strength level. So if you have a client who's in strength endurance or hypertrophy or max strength, doesn't matter which one they are in, you are going to be doing, uh, you are in the strength level, which means you are going to be doing active isolated stretches, right? So active isolated stretches uh, are, are, is, is what we refer to as active. The category is active flexibility, right? So active flexibility is the flexibility training that utilizes reciprocal inhibition to actively contract 
and relax muscles. And that results in an increased range of motion. So this is going to consist rather than um, the way corrective flexibility was SMR and static, active flexibility is SMR and active isolated stretches. And active isolated stretches, sometimes you'll hear people refer to these as contract relax stretches. I think that's actually what most people call them. Um, but sometimes you'll hear the word like contract relax stretches. So for instance, like let's say I was doing my hamstrings, right? And I took my leg up like this. Um, if I were here and then I actively contracted my quadriceps, which performed knee extension, that's going to straighten out my leg, right? So by contracting this, that stretches that. And so if I was like, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, and then I relax. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, and then I relax. Right, one, two, one, two. That's how I do active stretches. And there's benefits to this, you know? Like this also results in increased range of motion. This does it through reciprocal inhibition, which is slightly different than autogenic inhibition. Autogenic inhibition is where your nervous system was turning off your muscle spindle because you were poking a Golgi tendon organ or lengthening a Golgi tendon organ. Reciprocal inhibition is going to turn off a muscle because you are contracting the opposite muscle. Remember, your nervous system is designed to control agonists and antagonists. So if I contract my quadriceps, it will tell my hamstrings to shut up. <laughs> Just like if I contract my hamstrings, it'll tell my quadriceps to shut up, right? It has like the opposite effect, you know? If I'm contracting this way, it's gonna turn my back off. And if I'm contracting with my back, that's gonna turn my chest off. So that's reciprocal inhibition. So um, we wanna make sure that we are using that to our advantage. So I'm contracting my quadricep, that extends my leg, um, and that puts a stretch on my hamstring. And then I relax it. So I hold it for about one to two seconds, and I'm gonna do anywhere from five to 10 repetitions of that. I'm gonna do that for one to two sets. And that's your active flexibility protocols, right? Uh, but we do start with foam rolling. So we do inhibit first, but we just do, we're gonna do our lengthening through active isolated stretches. Um, so one to two second holds, five to 10 repetitions, and we'll do one to two sets. Um, does that make sense, guys? Yeah, it totally makes sense. Cool. Okay. So our last one, uh, our last level here, we're going to look at is the power level. Now, if you got a client in level three, or if they're in phase five, right? If they're in phase five, they're gonna be in level three. Um, clients who are in the power level, they are going to get dynamic stretches, right? So this is going to be, uh, our category is functional flexibility, right? So functional flexibility is flexibility training that utilizes dynamic movements that move through all planes of motion to actively stretch and warm up our muscles. So again, SMR, no surprise there, uh, but we are adding dynamic stretches in instead. So I will, I will warn you guys a little bit. Sometimes, you, sometimes students um, will be working on memorizing their, their stretches and uh, NASM likes to ask you flexibility questions in two different ways. They will sometimes ask you which of the following uh, types of flexibility is associated with, and they'll say like level one, level two, or level three. Types of flexibility are corrective flexibility, active flexibility, and functional flexibility. Those are your three main categories. Um, and then sometimes they'll say which of the following stretches are most appropriate for a client in, and then they'll say whatever level they're in. And your types of stretches are static stretches, active stretches, and dynamic stretches. So you do need to memorize it both ways. You need to know that the category is corrective flexibility. Corrective flexibility as a category consists of self myofascial release and static stretches. Active flexibility is the category and it consists of self myofascial release and active isolated stretches. And functional flexibility is the category and it consists of SMR, 
and dynamic stretches. Now, dynamic stretches, like I said, are stretches that move through multiple planes of motion or can move through multiple planes of motion um, in order to actively warm up your muscles. These really are not that great at improving your range of motion. That's not really their purpose. Their purpose is really just to kind of generally stretch the muscles, make sure they're nice and pliable, and that there's plenty of blood flow, oxygen, and nutrients going to the area. They're not really how we make someone more flexible. If I want someone to be more flexible, I need to do either static or active stretches, right? Dynamic stretches are, are, are just sort of a traditional warm up. That's really what they are, you know? If you don't have overactive muscles, great, do some dynamic stretches. Just get your blood pumping and then go hit the gym, you know? Um, but if you've got an overactive muscle, I'm probably gonna spend more time on a static stretch. So you're still gonna do SMR, so spend a few minutes foam rolling, and then you're gonna dive in to your dynamic stretches. And like I said, these are gonna be things, actually, Irene, you asked about calisthenics a minute ago. A lot of dynamic stretches are calisthenics. So they're things like arm circles, or neck rolls, or spinal twists, butt kicks, high knees, side lunges, body weight squats, reverse lunges, um, all kinds of little movements like that. Those are all going to be dynamic stretches, right? Um, because I'm moving through a full range of motion. I'm stretching something out. You know, um, I'm just not spending a ton of time in that stretched position. And so you're going to do probably, you're going to pick maybe three to 10 exercises. Um, and you're going to do 10 to 15 repetitions for each of those exercises. And you probably do one to two sets. I almost always do two sets. Um, cause I like to do it as like a little circuit. Um, so that's, that's how we're usually going to do that when we are doing things, right? So like, let's say I picked three to 10 exercises. Let's say I was doing like a walking lunge with an overhead reach. I would do maybe 10 repetitions of that on each leg, uh, turn and do maybe like a side shuffle, um, which will stretch out sort of like the inner thigh. Then I'll do like some Frankenstein straight leg kicks, you know, um, 10 to 15 repetitions of that. And there we go. I've done my I've done my hip flexors and quads. I did my hamstrings. And I did my adductors, right? Um, and then maybe do like a heel walk or something, right, to get the the calves as well. It's not bad. Not a not a bad little. You know, I hit all the the muscles of the lower body. I got some blood flow down there. Um, I didn't necessarily improve any of the range of motion necessarily, although I might not be feeling quite as stiff as I did before I walked into the gym. So I might get some temporary improvements in range of motion which is exactly what I'm going for, right? I'm about to work out. So I want some improvements in range of motion. Um, but I didn't necessarily like alter my joint mechanics, you know? Um, I didn't fix my posture by simply improving for just a few minutes, you know? Um, but what's kind of cool about your flexibility training is like um, when you're doing dynamic stretches, because they are kind of uh, body weight exercises, they get your heart rate a little bit elevated. And so normally we would follow up our flexibility training with some cardio afterwards to continue heating up the body. Um, but because the power level, these actually kind of get you a little bit out of breath, they actually count as your cardiovascular warm up, which is kind of cool. So um, lastly, let's just take a look before we, we're gonna wrap up um, this first PowerPoint here. But before we wrap up our lecture, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the exercise safety protocols when working with seniors. So um, self-myofascial release is contraindicated, which means that it should be totally avoided uh, in clients who have um, osteoporosis, spinal stenosis, general low back pain, or if they have really bad peripheral arterial disease or varicose veins, right? You guys recognize all of those from the special populations class. You'll remember where we said like, be careful with foam rolling. It could cause bruising. It could pinch the blood vessel. It could be very painful. So if your client has any of those conditions, it should be avoided. Uh, and use an alternative technique. Use you know use something else, right? Um, do not bounce in your end range of motion. Um, this is a rule for all freaking clients. You'll notice a minute ago when I was doing that active isolated stretch, right? Like I was contracting and I was relaxing slowly. I wasn't doing this. Bouncing, right? Or I wasn't doing this, right? I wasn't like bouncing at the end range of motion. All that bouncing does is stretch you beyond the point of sort of comfort, 
right? So when you do that little bounce, you might feel good because you're like, yeah, I got further than I did a second ago, right? And you bounced a little bit further. What ends up happening when you do that is your nervous system goes, ah, 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 ah. it's freaking out. <laughs> and you are actively turning on that muscle. <laughs> Not awesome. <laughs> That's actually the same thing that even happens in some dynamic stretches, right? Sometimes that actually turns on the muscles that you're stretching, which in the power level is a good thing because you're trying to be explosive. So you want your muscles turned on. Again, that's why we don't do dynamic stretches in stabilization and we don't do static stretches in power. They are different strokes for different folks. They are, you know, we have different purposes. I think that bouncing can be okay in some situations. If you're really trying to get a muscle nice and activated, go for it and bounce that thing. It's gonna turn your nervous system on and freak that muscle out, which is a good thing. <laughs> Suddenly that muscle's like, I'm up, Ugh, what, you know? <laughs> um, but when it comes to static stretches, definitely do not bounce at the end range. Um, ensure that your client is breathing the entire time. People are notorious for holding their breath during stretches. Um, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> cease the activity of pain or discomfort. If you're stretching and you look like this, stop it, right? Stretch less. <laughs> um, try to relax. It's supposed to be a relaxing sensation. If you turn, this is Robert. We were talking about the IT band earlier. That's why they sort of are putting the kibosh on on stretching your IT band. That's why we're sort of eliminating that from a lot of trainers' programs. Is because like it's so painful that people end up making more tension than they got, than they solved from stretching it. Cause they're like, ah, don't do that. Um, and always have assistance uh, for your clients. Uh, balance is available. You know, if you got a senior client and their balance is not so great, you know, that classic standing quad stretch. First off that stretch sucks anyways, but you know, this is, you know, you don't want your senior client tipping over. So always have, um, support there for your client uh, while they're stretching. So we love stretching. It improves our extensibility, our posture, and our movement patterns. Uh, we got a lot of different techniques. We've got foam, we've got corrective, a, um, active, and functional flexibility, which corresponds with static, active, and dynamic stretches. Uh, and we can manipulate our flexibility protocols by changing the duration, the intensity, the velocity, and the frequency. All of those things um, you know, are gonna have effects on our flexibility. Any questions on stretching? Feeling good, guys? All right, we are moving on to cardio land, my favorite land. So, um, let's take a look here at our cardiorespiratory fitness. So this is going to look really familiar to some of the stuff we've seen. They're back, the fit principles. <laughs> um, you guys should have these quite memorized by now. Um, so we are back to our fit principles. We're going to see those again. Uh, they're always something to consider whenever you're talking about cardio. Um, I, honestly, it, it's just like one of those things where it's like, yeah, man, like we got to understand intensity and duration. Um, so we're going to look at our cardiorespiratory guidelines today, um, talk about the benefits that come along with cardio training, um, the rationale for writing an effective cardio training program, understand our FIT principles, and sort of how to do all of that. So in general, before we get into the NASM zones and methods and percentages of heart rate and stuff, in general, when you are considering writing a program for someone you want to consider your FIT principles, right? Uh, we want to understand uh, that frequency and intensity and duration all have like opposite effects on each other. You know, as one goes up, the other's got to go down. Because if you are doing high frequency, high duration, and high intensity, you are... <laughs> I'm just, just like, you are high. Uh, no, you are headed to uh, injury city population U, you know? So, um, Frequency is the number of training sessions in a given time period. In general, the frequency that we want to recommend for our senior clients is going to be about two to five days per week for our older adults. Uh, intensity is the level of demand for your activity. Um, it's going to be anywhere from 40 to 85% of your VO2 max. Um, honestly, NASM doesn't usually use VO2 maxes. The most common version that you guys need to be familiar with uh, are going to be your heart rate training zone. So we're going to be anywhere from 
50 to 65% of our heart rate max if we are warming up. And then anywhere in like zone one, two, or three, which is 65 to 75, 76 to 85, 86 to 95 percent of your heart rate max. Um, then we've got time, which is the length of time spent in your activity. So 30 to 60 minutes a day, five days per week is really uh, enough for our senior clients to see some really positive effects or at least stave off the negative effects of inactivity. Um, or if they can't do a straight 30 minutes, then they can do multiple eight to 10 minute bouts instead. Um, type is the mode or you know choice of activity that you're doing with your clients. So recumbent bike, treadmill, swimming, walking, you know, uh, boot camps, <laughs> bear crawls, <laughs> you know, any of that stuff. Um, boxing, you know, any, any, all of that is 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 your type, you know. Um, and then enjoyment is the level of pleasure derived from the activity. Remember, we talked about during our assessment, we gather some of our general medical and history questionnaire. We gather, you know, a little bit of info about our clients' hobbies and stuff. And so um, figure out what they enjoy, figure out what they like. Um, so uh, those are sort of like general guidelines. Now, when you are prescribing intensity for your client, there's a couple different methods that we've got out here. Um, the first one is going to be uh, your Borg scale, right? So the Borg scale is also known as your RPE scale. That's your rating of perceived exertion. It's basically you are asking your client how hard they feel this activity is, right? Um, so it measures exercise intensity based on the perception of how hard the exercise is, right? So you might ask your client on a scale of six to 20, how hard was that round of cardio? And if they're like, oh, it was like a 19. And you're like, oh my God, <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't die in the middle of that round. That was great. <laughs> uh, I wanted you to be somewhere around like a 15. <laughs> Let's go ahead and bring that intensity down a little bit, right? Um, so that's your Borg scale. Um, so you can base these sensations on their heart rate, uh, respiration rate, sweating, or just general fatigue. Um, and it's not bad, by the way. The RPE scale is pretty good. Um, it is a little bit weird, 6 to 20, I know. Um, a lot of times people will use the modified Borg scale, and they'll go 1 to 10. Um, generally, exercise starts around like a 6, you know? Um, so then we've got the talk test method. This is another way to gauge uh, exercise intensity, um, but rather than gauging it on like how you're feeling, this is gonna be based on your ability to sort of hold a conversation. So it gauges exercise ability, or, I'm sorry, exercise intensity based on the difficulty your client might have while they are trying to talk. So if they can, if you want them in a gentle zone, um, you know, like if your client's in stabilization and you're just trying to build up their endurance, they're maybe new to a routine, right? They should be able to hold a conversation, buttons. Uh, they should be able to hold a conversation the entire time, right? Um, they really shouldn't be totally out of breath while you are working out. You know, you're trying to build up their baseline. Nobody can build endurance if they're going too hard, you know? This is a problem people have constantly. Uh, where people are like, I just can't do long distance running. I'm like, anyone can do a long distance running. And they're like, not me. I get too tired too quickly. I end up getting exhausted. I get a side stitch immediately. And it's like, that doesn't mean that you can't do long distance running. What that means is that you are running too hard out the gate. You got to slow down a little bit. And like, you're a sprinter and you need to fight your sprinter, <laughs> sprinter brain. I need you to calm down, <laughs> you know? Um, so that is uh, sort of what we're looking at on the talk test, right? They should be able to speak comfortably if they're in zone one. Um, zone two is the ability to, you know, they can speak, but it's slightly uncomfortable, you know, like maybe it's like little broken sentences, right? Um, and then zone three is like, they go to speak and then they vomit. No, um, <laughs> zone three is like, it should be generally pretty difficult to speak. Really broken sentences, you know, that's where someone's like, <sighs> you know, <laughs> one second. Um, that's your zone three. So, you know, it should be pretty comfortable. You should be able to hold a conversation in zone one. Um, it should be un a little bit uncomfortable in zone two, and it should be very uncomfortable to try to talk during zone three. Um, man, I remember I used to run with this guy, my buddy, Sean, he's like one of the fittest people I've ever known. And he used to be my workout partner. And, uh, he, he competed on Ninja Warrior actually. Um, and so like he and I would always kind of compete and you know, a lot of that upper body stuff, I could not keep up. <laughs> uh, and then cardio wise, like I was a great long distance runner, but Sean was such a great sprinter. 
and like we'd be out on like a giant trail run we'd be like six seven miles in and then he'd be like i'll race you that telephone pole and i'd be like why <laughs> but i would always go yeah of course let's do it and then we'd sprint and you know take off <laughs> um but that's a classic example of like you know, some people are are built for that zone one, zone two endurance, and some people are sprinters, you know, where they like to get out of breath super intensely and then kind of recover. Um, both are good. Both are really good. Yeah, what's up? Brett, zone one, two, three, is that related to working in that zone one, two, three? Like heart rate zones? Yeah. Um, I mean, not officially, but yeah, that's how you can apply them. There's only three. Uh there's only like three talk tests. And so there are three zones. So they kind of correspond really well together. Uh, okay. But the zones are a NASA thing. Uh, and the talk test is kind of its own thing. So I wouldn't say, I don't want to say 100% yes, like black and white. Um, but you can totally use it. That. And that's how I use it. Um, so yes, but with an asterisk. <laughs> I feel like when I give answers like that, I should have been a politician. <laughs> Um, so, uh, lastly, we've got our traditional stage training, which is what we're going to spend most of our time on today. Uh, and this is working at a percentage of your heart rate max, right? A percentage of your max heart rate. So this is going to base your exercise intensity rather than basing it on how your client feels or whether they can talk. This is literally basing it on hard data. Like what is their heart rate? Um, so. This is typically more advanced, uh, you know, with with a more advanced client who is actually very interested in, you know, stage training in particular, uh, and it often requires an actual heart rate monitor. Although you could always do it with like a stopwatch and, you know, just do it six seconds multiplied by ten. Um, I cannot tell you guys what a good idea it is to get a heart rate monitor, by the way, uh, and get the good ones. Get the uh, get like a chest strap heart rate monitor. They are. Just, if you are serious about your cardio, they are just the greatest tool um, uh, because they're super, super accurate. And like some of them have alarms. You can set your own like custom zones and be like, I want you to beep at me if I'm going too gentle and I want you to beep at me if I'm going too hard. So it can keep you in a specific training zone if you want to be, um, which is great for like, you know, learning how to like pace yourself and stuff. Um, if you're serious about like racing, uh, I definitely recommend getting one of those. So uh, working in a, ta talking about those stages, right? Looking in our zones here. So NASM is going to break down, um, you know, we've got our levels here. NASM for some reason decides to break these down even further. Um, the reason, uh, in general, they're going to correspond with your levels, but I get what they're doing here. Um, you know, like if you had somebody, if you were training somebody like me, who does a lot of cardio, you know, I like to do a lot of stage two and a lot of stage three cardio training. Um, if I was brand new to you as a client, you should absolutely start me in stabilization because I'm a brand new client and you should start new clients in stabilization. Um, but cardio wise, you don't necessarily need to bring me all the way back down to stage, you know, only zone one workouts. So there's going to be a little bit of a difference here. So we're going to see NASA stage training. You're going to see some stages here that are going to correspond directly with our levels. So you're going to see um, stages and zones here. And those stages and those zones are going to correspond really well with our levels one, two, and three. Um, but yeah, there's just, they don't do a great, okay. All right, we're going to do a weird thing. We're going to open up this picture. Copy. And that's, that's why we do the YMCA three minute step test, right? Exactly. So we can figure out what stages your client qualifies for. So, um, eh, <laughs> in there. All right, so um, we've got stage one here, we've got stage two here. And we've got stage three here. So these are your cardiovascular stages, right? Um, you will, I mean, look at this. This is literally corresponding directly with what we see in our levels. So 
Unfortunately, it's a little bit more vocabulary for you guys to memorize, right? We've got level one, two, and three, phase one, two, three, four, five. Well, you've got stage one, two, and three. And within stage one, two, and three, you have also got um, zone one. Stage two is going to be zone one and, oops, zone one and zone two. And stage three, this isn't going to fit, <laughs> zone one, zone two, and zone three. Hey guys, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, my internet crapped out for a second. Okay, uh, put that back on screen share. All right, my internet's starting to be a jerk, so I'm gonna try and get through this quickly now. <laughs> uh, can you guys both hear me? Irene, Robert? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, all right, so those are our, our levels that correspond with our stages, right? Um, so if we take a look at this in terms of like overall program design, if you've got a client who is in level, uh, in level one, so they're in stabilization, you are going to give them a stage one cardiorespiratory routine. This is your baseline cardio stage. It's designed to improve general overall fitness levels for sedentary folks, right? So this is steady state cardio. When you think about like going for a run and you're just gonna go for a, step one, start running, there's no step two. Yeah, like you just keep going, right? Like that's your steady state cardio. You're just gonna be at uh, stage one cardio, which is only going to consist of zone one. Now zone one is going to be 65 to 75% of your heart rate max, right? So when we look at stage one, you want to slowly work your client up to 30 to 60 minutes. You may need to start with shorter bouts of exercise because they might not have like good running economy. Um, so you might find that they like blast right through stage one way too quickly because like there is sometimes like this level right between like a walk and a jog where like you know, some people just can't maintain a jog, but a walk is too gentle. And so like, they just don't have very good running economy yet until they kind of get used to it. And then once their body kind of adapts and develops enough muscle to kind of handle that, then they can actually slowly like maintain a jog. So you might need to break it up into eight to 10 minute bouts. But once your client can do about 30 minutes in zone one, they're ready for stage two. Alternatively, you could also just do a reassessment and, and see if they qualify for stage two by giving them the three minute step test or the Rockport walk test again until eventually their scores improve enough that you can give them a stage two routine. So then we've got the strength level, right? Um, strength level is uh, for clients who are in level two, right? So that's gonna be a stage two cardio routine. This is gonna introduce interval training and it's gonna focus on developing uh, the, an increased lactate threshold, which is that moment where you, have, you are officially producing more lactic acid than you can kind of process uh, with your metabolism. So now there's lactic acid left over, this is where the burning comes in, right? Um, so that's your lactate threshold. We wanna be able to kind of handle as much lactic acid as possible because lactic acid is a fuel source. So the more of it we can produce, the better but we don't want to get to a point where it's like, oh, my legs weigh a thousand pounds, you know, because it's burning too much. So that's why we have interval training. We sort of develop a bunch of lactic acid, then we slow down a little bit to kind of, you know, get rid of, get rid of all that. Then we speed it up again, and then we slow it down. And so this is where we start to do sort of low intensity interval training. This is not HIIT training, by the way. This is an introduction to interval training. So this is low intensity intervals, not high intensity intervals. So you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna alternate between zone one and zone two, right? So you might warm up for five to 10 minutes in zone one, or maybe even below zone one, just cause it's a warm up. Um, then you're gonna do an interval in zone one for maybe three minutes. 
then you're going to do an interval in zone two for about one minute and then you're going to alternate between those two three minutes of recovery one minute of hard work and that is why if we look at our little picture here we are doing both zone one and zone two that's a stage two routine um, so clients in the strength level benefit from that really well because this is all about lactic acid production right um, which goes really well with hypertrophy and strength endurance. Um, so that's actually why bodybuilders, I know they usually avoid cardio like the plague, but they do benefit from stage two cardiorespiratory training. And then lastly, if we've got a client who's in the power level, so this is, uh, they're, in level, they're in level three, which would be phase five, they would be doing stage three cardio routines, which is gonna consist of zones one, zones two and zone three, right? So that is an very, this is a very advanced cardiorespiratory training uh, protocol. This really is for clients who already have a very good lactate threshold. Um, the idea here is that you are enhancing your peak work capacity, right? Your power output during your cardio. Um, so that's gonna be zones one, zone two, and zone three. 70, 65 to 75% of your heart rate max, 76 to 85%, and 86 to 95%. So you might warm up in zone one, uh, do two minutes in zone two, one minute in zone three, which is gonna leave you quite exhausted. And then we're gonna recover back in zone two or even recover all the way back in zone one if you're new to it. Um, so that's a much more advanced routine. So uh, NASM's got a really good approach to this, by the way, um, on their blog. Uh, come on, uh, stage training. So if you look at this, um, there's some really good stage training principles up here on this little article. Um, and it talks about moving through zones one, zones two, and zones three. So we've got a, we got a stage one, client, right, who is maybe new to cardio, you're going to work for 30 to 60 minutes. Stage two clients is sort of uh, much higher. This is going to be working all the way in a range between 65 to 85%. So that's zone one up to the top of zone two. Uh, and then we have our stage three clients, which are like, you know, working all the way from 65 to 95% because um, you are doing all three zones there. So again, if you look at these, if you look at our notes here, you'll notice we've got zone one, that's 65 to 75% heart rate max. You've got zone two, which is 76 to 85%, and you got zone three, which is 86 to 95. So uh, Robert, let's use you as an example. Um, Robert, how old are you? 25. All right, and do you know what your resting heart rate is? Mm. No. Ah, let's assume we'll say 65. Okay, which is pretty low, but I'm pretty confident that's probably not too not too inaccurate. So remember, guys, uh, heart rate max is going to now equal if we're doing that carbon in formula, right? So I take 220 minus 25. That means that his heart rate max is 195. Okay. Um, so if I did the straight percentage formula, which is just his heart rate max times an intensity, right? Um, then that is going to mean that I would go 195, whoops, times 0.65, um, 127 to 146. And if I gave him his zone two, I would go 195 times 0.76. So that's 76 to 85%. That's going to be 148 to 166. And then if I were 195 times uh, 185. There we go. So um, there's our straight percentage version here, right? So if I if I if Robert was my client and I had him have like a stage one cardio routine and he I told encouraged him to buy a heart rate monitor, I would say, all right. Robert, today, 
I want you to hit the treadmill for about 30 minutes. I want you to be between 127 and 146 on your heart rate. Cool? And that's his whole routine for the day. Nothing fancy there, right? But if Robert was doing a stage two routine, I'm going to have him do um, alternating between zones one and zone two. So I'd say, Robert, I want you to be between uh, 148 and 166 for about one minute. Um, that's going to get you a little bit out of breath. Then I want you to recover somewhere between 127 and 146 for three minutes. Then I want you to repeat that for a total of 20 minutes. Okay, so there's his stage two routine. And then his stage three routine would use all three of these zones, right? So I'd say I want you to be between 168 and 185 for one minute. Then I want you to be between 148 and 166 for one minute. And then I want you to recover at 127 to 146 for one minute. Not bad, right? But we could be even more accurate here if we took into account the carbonin formula. which is gonna be a little bit different instead. And so that is going to be uh, 195 minus 65 times 0.65 plus 65. So that's gonna be his new zone one with the carbonin formula is gonna be 150, which is much, much higher. <laughs> 130. So there would be a much more accurate version. It'd be the same thing, right? Give them the same, I'd totally give them the same workout. Um, and maybe I just pick the number that's like right between the middle of each of these. So he doesn't really have to worry about the ranges, right? I could totally just tell him what I want his heart rate to be around. Like, Robert, I want you to be around 156 for 30 minutes straight. Or I want you to be around... Uh, one uh, seventy for three for one minute, and then I want you to recover around one fifty six for three minutes. So that's where heart rate monitors really do come in handy, guys. You see, does that make sense for how to use these how to use these zones? Did that kind of make that highlight really clear? Cool. And by the way, Robert, I don't hope if your heart rate actually is sixty five, those numbers are accurate. So you know, keep them. <laughs> Uh, take a screenshot. <laughs> All right. Um, so if you do not like, if your client on their general medical history questionnaire is like, I hate cardio, right? Which is what so many people say. Uh, that's okay. Doesn't mean that you have to do treadmill, you know, it doesn't have to be always on the treadmill. It could, there are other ways to do cardiorespiratory training, like circuit training, for instance. Um, which is going to be, you know, a series of exercises with minimal rest. That can totally be implemented, you know. Um, if I had a client uh, and I want to implement my cardiorespiratory training as like a circuit, if I've got a zone one, you know, client, well, then I'm going to make it a pretty gentle circuit that is pretty much nonstop. If I've got a stage two client, they're going to have some pretty challenging exercises followed by some pretty gentle exercises as like a circuit. So it might be something like, you know, high knees, which will really get your heart rate up, followed by just some gentle body weight squats, followed by maybe something like burpees, right? Followed by um, maybe like a general chest press. You know, like their heart rate goes up, their heart rate comes down. So I do gentle little intervals if I had stage two. And then if I got a stage three client, they are going nuts 
you know, where I'm really trying to get their heart rate up, where it's like burpees, followed by box squats, followed by kettlebell squeans, followed by cleans, you know, like boom, 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 bear crawls, all this stuff that like, <sighs> maybe even working some sprints in there, something that really gets their heart rate up. Uh, and then I bring it back down um, and I go from high to low. So when you think about your stages, right, you've got steady state cardio is very much your stage one. You've got low intensity interval training, that's your stage two. And you've got high intensity interval training, that's your stage three. Here's a really good sample program, by the way, um, of implementing circuit training as your cardio. Uh, so you do five to 10 minutes of like foam rolling and stretching and stuff, followed by five to 10 minutes of cardio, followed by 15 to 20 minutes of circuit training. And they're saying alternate between upper and lower, which is great because you have a little peripheral heart action in there. Follow it up with a little bit more cardio at the end, stretch them out, kick them out of the gym. There you go. There's your whole program. <laughs> it's not bad. Uh, now, when it comes to cardio and our safety guidelines, um, always make sure you're using the safety clips with senior clients, just in case. Uh, we do know they are at risk for falling. Um, so safety clips are really important. You don't want to have your clients shoot off the back of the treadmill. Um, advise your clients to wear appropriate clothing. Again, those baggy windbreakers, they get caught on everything. Um, so don't let your client wear those. Um, make sure you are teaching your clients how to use the cardio equipment. Uh, that's a, I mean, do that with all your clients. This is not a senior thing. <laughs> um, but always teach your clients like how to use that stuff properly. Um, always keep an eye out for uh, symptoms of exhaustion, like low sweat rate, um, overheating, uh, excessive thirst, things like that. And then always, always, always warm up and cool down um, before and after your conditioning. So um, the nice thing about cardio is it uses the entire bioenergetic continuum. It goes, you know, every type of, of metabolism that we've got. Your fit principles are going to be really nice um, protocols to kind of keep you in alignment with stuff to uh, write a good, effective program that's also really fun. Um, and then stage training is a great way to make sure that you are progressing your clients slowly uh, without overtaxing them. Oh, and then circuit training is a great way to, you know, get the best of both worlds, strength and um, cardio simultaneously. So before I kick you guys out of here, I do want to show you a couple sample programs. Um, this is going to be a handout that's available for download on Canvas today. Uh, but if you take a look here, Actually, I don't need this open anymore, so I can just open this. Uh, let's say we got our client, Bob, here, who's trying to get better at golf. He's trying to increase his athleticism. He is a senior client who has an anterior pelvic tilt. Um, so we're going to train Bob for three months. Month one, he's going to be in stabilization. Month two, he is going to be in strength. And month three, he's going to be in power. So you can see... Um, we're going to start with corrective flexibility for Bob's first month. That's going to be foam rolling and static stretches. And then for his cardio conditioning, it's, uh, he's doing steady state cardio. He's in zone, he's in stage one, which only consists of zone one. So put him on the treadmill, one set, 30 minutes, 65 to 75% of his heart rate max, right? Cool down. Totally the exact same thing, just in reverse, right? And that's about an hour in the gym. Not bad, right? Pretty simple. Month two, we get a little complicated, right? Now we're gonna start implementing some active isolated stretches. So we're stretching the same muscles, but instead of doing static stretches, we're doing active stretches. Um, and then when we put him on the treadmill now, he's gonna do five low intensity interval sets. One minute at zone two, that's 76 to 85% of his heart rate max, and three minutes in zone one, which is again, 65 to 75%. So he's got a one to three work to rest ratio here. Then we're gonna cool him down by doing stretches again. You'll notice we're doing static stretches here, uh, and that's because the workout is over. I don't care about turning those muscles off, right? I did active stretches because he's in strength, he's working harder, I don't wanna inhibit his muscles. But because the workout's over, I'm totally going to cool down with static stretches. There's no reason to not do static stretches once the workout is over. Then we've got him in month three here. Uh, you'll notice we skipped the cardio warm up because we've got him doing some dynamic stretches. So he did a little bit of foam rolling for his calves and hip flexors. Those are still tight, just like they were. But now he's going to do some heel walks, butt kickers, hand pecs, spinal rotations, and a walking lunge with a twist. Two sets of 10 repetitions each. That'll get his heart rate pretty elevated. Uh, and he's going to be nice and warm to go right into his super intense cardio workout. 
where you put him at 30 seconds in zone three. This is a stage three cardio routine. Uh, 30 seconds in stage three, uh, I'm sorry, 30 seconds in zone three, one minute in zone two, and one minute in zone one. That's a total of two and a half minutes. He's gonna do eight rounds of that. So that'll be about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, and then we will have him sort of repeat that. And then he's gonna cool down, totally the same situation. Foam roll his calves, foam roll his hip flexors, static stretch everything, and get the heck out of the gym. <laughs> um, so uh, do you guys have any questions on that? <laughs> we'll party hat. Uh, feeling good, guys? All right. Well, homework number two is going to go out today. Um, it's going to cover today and fitness assessments. So take a look at that. It'll be up on Canvas here in just a little bit. Um, may take me a little bit longer to get the recording up. I think when my internet went down, it cut the recording out and then it picked back up afterwards. So I'm probably going to have to edit these two together. Uh, which always takes a really long time. So um, look for the homework and stuff, but it might be up a little bit slower today. Um, but you got the whole weekend. I just realized it's Friday. I totally forgot it was Friday. Um, you got the whole weekend, so you have plenty of time to knock it out. Um, and if you guys don't have any questions, I'm going to let you all go. Uh, I got a question really quick, Brad. Yeah, what's up? Um, maybe you could cut the recording because it's probably not part of it, but... Uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, all right, well, I mean, it's, 